Hey there, my pumpkin-spiced pilfers of fear. Looks like I made it just in the nick of time. It sure does take a lot of work to put this marathon together, but luckily for me, I have a really understanding family. I told you to take out the trash. Um, now what am I supposed to do? Oh wait, I know! Yeah, hi. Is this Mr. Creepypasta? Uh, wait, who is this? This is Pockets Lockhart. Um, Sociopathic is my husband. You know, the horror writer and the YouTuber. Sociopathic? Who? Oh, well, never mind. It's just, he was supposed to introduce tonight's Halloween marathon opener, and, uh, I kind of kind of set off. Do you think you could do it while I try and fix the situation? Well, I would be honored. I want to thank you all for stopping in tonight for a little Halloween tale sure to ruffle your down. A pumpkin spice story aptly called Black Feathers on a Halloween night. I used to love trick-or-treating, but not anymore. Not since I moved to this podunk nowhere town. When I first moved here, it was the beginning of the school year, actually a few weeks after I had started. Meaning it was already mid-September when I was first introduced to this town and its residents. I knew little about the area and knew even less about the people that lived here. For weeks, I found it incredibly difficult to make even a single friend. People seemed to avoid me like a leper. It was actually about mid-October when I had first met and began talking to Chris. Chris sat with me at lunch. We had none of the same classes together, lived on opposite ends of town, so we barely saw one another outside of the lunch table. All seemed to be going well until I mentioned where I lived. That's when I found out that part of the reason my peers avoided me was because of where I lived. Apparently, the house I was living in had been the scene of a brutal murder decades beforehand, and as a result, the woods were haunted. I asked Chris for more information, but he told me that it was all just silly, the folly of unimaginative teenage minds that he no further got along with than I did. So, I eventually dropped the subject, and over the course of the next few days, I forgot about it entirely. That is, until Halloween night. See, I really enjoy Halloween, and even as a teen who's old enough to walk the streets alone, I found myself not old enough to stop trick-or-treating. I mean, is 15 really too old? Not I, or Chris, who I would be meeting, thought so. The house that we were living in was just a normal house, no odd instances of hauntings or supernatural presences. But it was on the outskirts of town, butted up against a forest that stood between the two. There was an old path that cut through the forest, leading to town, diminishing my walk significantly. I'd made this walk several times during the day, but now, standing at the path's entryway, leading into a thicket of tall, woody pines that towered over me like gigantic, looming figures, the dirt trail stretching into a black nothingness. Chris's warning floated to my conscious thoughts. But I reassured myself that I had done this before, that now the woods were just dark, and dressed in my Leatherface costume, small flashlight cutting a beam into the darkness like a knife, I began down that path entering that forest until the darkness had swallowed me whole. It was quiet in the forest, and the deeper in I went, the less light from the moon overhead leaked in through the canopy above. But as it grew darker, it had grown deafeningly still. It was autumn, most forest life had begun hibernating. But this was different. 
It was like if silence could be a sound, it would have been deafening. It was so still, it literally drew my attention to it. I was starting to feel a bit awkward, like I felt as though I should simply turn around and leave, head home. I scanned my surroundings and saw nothing. There was nothing to warrant my uneasiness, so I brushed it aside to the festive nature of the season and the dark night that enveloped me. I reassured myself and continued onward. Not more than two steps, and a loud flapping sound broke the utter stillness like an orchestra, causing me to jump with fear. But before my panic could even subside, I realized what it was. A large bird. A raven had flown into the path in front of me, landing on a branch at eye level only ten or so meters away. I clutched my chest with a sigh of relief, scalding myself for my silly fright over nothing. But as the waters of trepidation retreated, they were replaced by the sensation of dread. There was something wrong with this bird. I suddenly realized crows aren't typically active at night, and there was something wrong with this one. It seemed to be about two times the size of a normal raven. Its eyes seemed golden and cat-like. It stared right at me. I cautiously approached, and the bird's head moved to keep me in view, but the thing itself did not move. Now I was starting to feel silly again. It was just a bird after all. Slowly, I strolled past it, and once by the thing, it changed positions to once again keep a locked focus on me as I walked by. At about five feet away, I turned back to look, and the bird was still sitting upon the branch, staring at me. But as I looked, the thing's beak opened wide like it was going to yawn. And then, the thing let out this blood-curdling shriek, almost human, shrill, and eerie. I'd never heard a bird make a sound like that before. I started jogging to town, not looking back. A few hundred yards later, I stopped. There was something terribly off, or just wrong-looking. I said that I had been down this path a few times before, and it was daylight then. Now, in the darkness of the forest to my right, there was a strange glow of illumination. It wasn't a flickering light, so I knew it couldn't be a campfire. As I drew nearer, I realized the light to be coming from a rectangular aperture, a window. There was a fucking cabin about 30 meters in the tree line, and someone had to be occupying it, for there was light emanating from inside. This was impossible. I would have noticed a fucking cabin in the woods, especially during the day. But I figured that maybe I had somehow overlooked it. Carefully, I slowly approached and peered inside. My jaw went slack, and I could feel the blood rushing from my face, surely leaving me pale and ghostly. The interior boasted a single room, the floor completely empty. However, suspended from the ceiling as if glued or nailed, was an entire living room. Couch, chairs, end table, hell, there was even a carpet on the ceiling. This was for obvious reasons, unsettling. Initially, quietly and stealthily, increasing to a jogging, running, and sprinting pace respectfully the further I got from the structure, I retreated into the darkness, determined to end my night early and heading back down the path towards my home. The path was long seemingly endless, and soon the cabin was far behind me, out of sight. But then I remembered the raven, and I truly began to fear that the creepy creature would be up ahead, still waiting for me, ready to scream. But I shined my shaky beam of light in front of me, 
and there was no crow where I had expected to see it. Relieved, I began walking again. Maybe fifteen steps. And I heard a stick break behind me. I turned to see what had made the noise. And I'll never forget what I saw. There was a woman standing dead center in the path behind me. She was facing me and staring unrelentingly, unmovingly, in my direction. She was wearing a long, flowing, tattered and torn dress. One that was likely white, but had become gray and brown with age and filth. Her hair was dark, either black or appearing as such under a cloak of darkness. And much of her face was concealed by the hair that dangled over half of it. But her eyes, her eyes were a golden, cat-like yellow. This attribute would have been enough to send me reeling in traumatic terror, but then she opened her mouth wide, almost too wide. The thing I feared would happen next indeed came to pass. The woman belted a powerful, high-pitched, shrill shriek that was identical to the crow that had unnerved me earlier. I can't be sure if I was followed. I ran full speed back to my house and never looked back. The following day in school, I was hesitant to tell anyone what had happened. No one, parents included, would have believed me. But when Chris kept prompting me at lunch to tell him what had happened, why I didn't meet him for trick-or-treating, I told him everything, thinking he would think me mad. I watched the color drain from his face instantly, and I knew that he believed me. I had to know what he knew and wasn't telling me, and after I insisted, he did so. He finally caved. Apparently, there had been a family murdered in my house. However, their youngest daughter, Angela, was never found. Some say that she was abducted, and others say that she was the one who committed the terrible crime. But all accounts agreed. Angela was nowhere to be found. However, residents speak of a local legend, of a girl dressed in white living in those old woods, a crazy old hermit whispered to be a witch. Sightings are infrequent, but have prompted investigation by police from time to time as they occur. They've never found her, or any old cabin. All they've ever found, in the places where she had been last seen, are collections of black raven's feathers, always nearby to barefooted human prints impressioned into the forest floor. <clears throat> oh, that's better. Well, it looks like I can finally introduce tonight's story. Well... Mr. Creepypasta already did that for you. What? <laughs> and I missed it? Maybe next year. Anyway, I sure hope you liked tonight's opening story, a sure sign of spooky things to come. But if you're not feeling too flighty, make sure to come back tomorrow for night two of this horror go-round, counting down to the big night. Spooky tomorrow. Really, I missed Mr. Creepypasta. Sorry.